Hi everyone and welcome to our video on muscle. This is part of our module 5 part 5 series on plant and animal responses and in this video we'll be looking at specification reference 5.1.5 L part 1 the structure of mammalian muscle and the me mechanism of muscular contraction and 5.1.5 L part 2 the examination of stain sections or photomicrographs of skeletal muscle. So when we are talking about muscle, we are talking about three different types for your A-level. We've got involuntary or smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and the voluntary, which is the skeletal or striated muscle. Just to start with the real basics, the way that muscles are going to contract is through the action of two filaments. We've got actin and we've got myosin, and they're both proteins. And what happens is those two filaments are going to interact with each other and we'll find out more about that in the next video and that means we will have a contraction of the muscle itself. What we typically find is that muscles occur in what we term antagonistic pairs and they have to be antagonistic because following that contraction to elongate again they need something acting the opposite way. So if you think of things like your arm, you've obviously got your biceps and your triceps. When one elongates, the other is contracted and vice versa. So we've got these antagonistic pairs of muscles to actually allow that elongation post contraction. What we're going to do then is go through those three different types of muscle one at a time, having a look at the detail we need for the A-level paper. So we'll start off with the involuntary or smooth muscle. Now, the involuntary or smooth muscle contains the actin and the myosin filaments, but it doesn't have striations. And we're going to see those much more clearly when we look at the voluntary muscle slides, because when you see the pictures, you see these little bands, basically. Now, the smooth muscle doesn't have that. We still have actin and myosin filaments, but you don't get those striations that we do with the voluntary. In terms of where we find this smooth muscle, then we find it on the walls of certain internal organs, things like your bladder, the uterus, blood vessels, intestines, they've all got this smooth muscle present. When we consider what one of these cells actually looks like then, we've got a little picture in the bottom left there. So we describe them as being spindle shaped. So we've basically got a wider middle and then narrower ends. So that's what we mean by a spindle shape. Typically these cells are about 500 micrometers long and about five micrometers wide, and they've got a single nucleus. So that's the diagram. And on the right, we've got our light microscope image. And of course we know it's a light microscope image because we can see many whole cells in there. So when you're looking at this, you can pick out the fact, obviously the dark purple splodges here are going to be the nuclei and you can make out the shapes of those cells. So they do have that tapered end and you can see on this one, it's quite clear, a little pointy end there, and it does get wider in that middle section. So that's a little section of our smooth or involuntary muscle. Key thing about how this involuntary muscle contracts is that it's slow and regular. So this is not rapid contraction. This is just a very slow, regular contraction that takes place and it's controlled by the autonomic nervous system. The second type of muscle we need to know about is one we've talked about previously in both this module and in module three, cardiac muscle. Now cardiac muscle is special, it's only found in the heart and it's striated muscle that's specialized. And one of the key things that makes it special is that it is myogenic. And remember myogenic means that it is capable of contracting without any external wave of excitation arriving. When we look at the structure of the cardiac muscle then, these muscle fibers are actually branched. And what happens is they form this whole network that extends through the walls of the atria and the ventricles. The key thing about this myogenic muscle, this cardiac muscle, 
is it's not only able to control its own contraction there, but it doesn't tire or fatigue. So obviously quite beneficial because you don't really want your heart being made of a muscle type that is going to experience fatigue. Otherwise, it's going to stop beating. And obviously, if your heart stops beating, it's not really looking good for you. So key thing, it doesn't fatigue, so it can be continuously throughout the whole organism's lifetime. When we look at the little diagram at the bottom, what you can see here is we've got our fibres, but do notice how we've got these little branches that interconnect across. So you can see that this one little fibre here has actually got a little branch that comes down and therefore interconnects. And what we have are these things called intercalated discs that connect those fibres. And the reason we've got these intercalated discs is to actually transfer that depolarization from one cell to another. If we consider the structures that are going to be found within our cardiac muscle cells, we're going to need large numbers of mitochondria because these are continually contracting. Therefore, they're going to need large quantities of ATP. Where do we get ATP from? Respiration, which takes place inside the mitochondria. We did mention those intercalated discs on our previous slide, and we can see on that diagram, this little pink line here is one of those intercalated discs that we can see the connections between the individual muscle fibers. And what we see is that's actually a specialized cell surface membrane. So what we've got is basically a fusion between these membranes. Now, that means we're no longer having to have kind of controlled diffusion of these ions. There's completely free movement of them between those cells. And that obviously increases the rate at which that can happen and therefore means those transmissions of depolarization can happen quicker. Our third type of muscle is the voluntary or the skeletal muscle, sometimes called striated. So skeletal muscle is found at the joints in your skeleton, hence skeletal muscle. And these ones occur in these antagonistic pairs. So one contracts as the other relaxes and vice versa. And the key thing about the cells that make up our skeletal muscle is they are made from fibers about 100 micrometers in diameter and they're multi-nucleate. So they've got many nuclei. So multi-nucleate, many nuclei. They also have a special membrane around them called the sarcolemma. So sarco is to do with muscles and obviously the lemma is just telling us it's a membrane there. We also have a stuff called the sarcoplasm, which again, sarco meaning muscles and plasm like cytoplasm. This is just the cytoplasm in the skeletal muscle cells. But the sarcoplasm contains lots of mitochondria because obviously we have the requirement for a larger amount of ATP and we've got a stuff called sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is basically like the endoplasmic reticulum but it stores lots of calcium ions. And this sarcoplasmic reticulum with its calcium ion stores is gonna be incredibly important when it comes to contraction. If we then have a little look at what our skeletal muscle looks like then, the fibers are arranged into these things called myofibrils, and they're divided into these little individual units called a sarcomere. So in our little diagram here, we can see one sarcomere, which runs from one Z line to another Z line. And these are called Z lines because if you have a look at the actual pattern, it looks like a whole bunch of little Zs running down. So in the very center, we have another line called the M line. So the M line is the very center of our sarcomere, the ends of it, the Z lines. So we've got two lines. We then have these things called bands, and we've got two bands we should know, the A band and the I band. The A band, first of all, is made of both actin and myosin. So these are what we can term the dark bands, because when you look at them under a microscope, they are going to appear darker than the other bits. Now, 
the fact they're made of both actin and myosin. Actin is a thin filament and the myosin is a thick filament. So if we have a look at the bottom diagram here, we can see what I mean. So the big thick pink lines in the middle there, so these ones, are the myosin, the thick filaments. Then running alongside them, the purple ones are the thin filaments made of actin. So in the next video, we're going to have a look to see how these interact to cause the muscle to contract. But at this point, we just need to understand what they are. So A band is made of both actin and myosin, and it's darker on that light microscope image. We then have the light band, which is the I band. And if we look here, it's this section. So it's only made of the actin filaments. So there's no myosin in the I band. The myosin is only in the A band, but actin in both of them. The I band itself is made of three proteins, actin, troponin and tropomyosin, and they all join together in this little structure. So we've got actin and there's actually two polypeptides that make up our actin. They're running twisted around each other, like you've got two shoelaces twisted around. And then around the outside, you've got that pink line, which is our tropomyosin, and attached onto that at specific intervals, we have troponin. And this is again, something that's very important when it comes to muscle contraction. So we'll look at exactly how this all ties together to allow muscles to contract in the next video. Key thing about this voluntary or skeletal muscle is that it contract quickly, and powerfully. Downside, it also fatigues quickly. Now, obviously, that does mean that we have the ability to create quite powerful movements, useful in terms of obviously moving body parts, etc. But the fatiguing is obviously not great, because when it fatigues, obviously, we're building up things like lactate, and that's going to prevent us from utilising that muscle for an extended period beyond that lactate formation. In terms of what bit of our body controls it, it is the somatic nervous system. One thing that's probably quite useful for you is this little table here. So we've got our three types of muscles, skeletal, cardiac and involuntary or the smooth. And then all I've done is give you the three kind of key features, if you like, that you need to be able to compare the contraction speed, the fibers and whether it's conscious or unconscious control. So I would suggest you basically try to create this little table yourselves and then just cover up little bits, test yourself until you can fill it in. The last bit that we're going to look at in our video today is having a look at this thing called the neuromuscular junction. And basically this is how we're going to have a connection between the nervous system and the muscle, hence neuromuscular. So neuro to do with our nervous system, muscular to do with the muscles and the junction where they join. And this is what it looks like. So key thing, our neuromuscular junction is similar to a synapse, but there are some key differences to remember. First of all, we've got acetylcholine being released at the end of the motor neuron. Other neurotransmitters are used in other types of synapse. So acetylcholine is used in the neuromuscular junction. We also have a lot of folds on that postsynaptic membrane. So when you look at the diagram, you saw it's actually very folded on that postsynaptic membrane because folding increases surface area. And that means we can have more receptors present on that postsynaptic membrane. Those obviously receptors are for the acetylcholine, so it can bind easily. In terms of how this works then, first thing, we have an actual potential that arrives at the end of that motor neuron, and when it does so, it's going to cause calcium ions to enter. And the reason it does that is because we've got calcium ion channels that are going to open in that membrane. So those voltage gated calcium channels, which are these little pink things in our diagram, they're going to open. And as a result, we get a large number of calcium ions moving in to that little end of the motor neuron. As a result, vesicles that contain our acetylcholine, that neurotransmitter, 
are going to then be moved to fuse with the membrane of the synaptic knob there. And what's going to happen at that point is we will release the acetylcholine. It diffuses across the synaptic cleft. Please remember that this little gap here is the synaptic cleft. And the actual acetylcholine is then going to fuse with the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. When we've got that fusion of the acetylcholine with their receptors, that causes sodium ion channels to open. And as a result, sodium ions enter the muscle fiber, causing the sarcolemma to depolarize. Because obviously what we're doing there is we're moving positively charged ions into those cells, therefore changing the actual potential difference across the membrane. So it depolarizes it. That depolarization is going to spread across the sarcolemma and through these things called transverse tubules. So what we actually have are these structures that run right the way down through the muscle fiber. So these are our little transverse tubules. And that just means that we can have more rapid depolarization spreading through the whole fiber. Last thing for today is just to know that when we're looking at this stimulation of muscle fibers, in some cases, motor neurons stimulate a single muscle fiber. But quite frequently, what we find is that there are many motor neurons dividing up and connecting to several muscle fibers. So what that means is that one action potential is then going to be able to stimulate several muscle fibers to contract together, and that gives a much stronger contraction. So depending on what the body wants to achieve, we will see those different scenarios. If we want much finer movements, we're going to see that single connection. If we want a much larger kind of gross movement of the body, it's going to be multiple connections that we've got there. So think about basically the difference between moving the very tip of your finger, single muscle, versus your entire thigh moving, many muscle fibers contracting together. As always, I hope you found this video useful and don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you can see when the next one is uploaded and head on over to the website where you can find a range of other resources to help you in your A-level biology studies.